All right, lesson 53, Exodus chapter 32. So we left off last time where God was giving the directions to Moses. He had gone up into the mount. How many days and nights was Moses up in that mount again, getting those directions? Brody? He's up there for 40 days and 40 nights. And we see what was happening with God and Moses up on that mountain. This time we're going to take a look at what was happening back in the camp. Remember, Joshua had gone part way up the hill. Aaron and Hur had been left in charge of the people in the camp. So uh, Moses is up there in the presence of God. The people can obviously see that large cloud sitting on top of the mountain. The people can obviously see and hear the thunderings and rumblings of the Lord speaking with Moses. So they know where God is. And they know... That Moses went up into the mount. But days are passing, and so we begin to see some sin. Ready? Follow along in your Bibles here. Exodus chapter 32. You actually have a Bible that you can start on your iPad. You'll be writing, and then you can't look up. In your... If you've got a Bible, take out your Bible, because you can't write and look at the Bible at the same time. Bible, Joe? You got a physical Bible? Hmm. Let me see if we can get one from home. We'll have to email mom and dad or something. That way you can write. Thank you. There. All right. So, chapter 32, uh, verses, well, we'll read a few of the verses here at the beginning just to take a look at what's going on. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which are in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, And they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. So Moses has been up in that mountain. He's been gone for a while, a few weeks probably already, maybe a few more than that. We know, up to 40 days, but while Moses is up there, the people begin to, well, who is our leader? Maybe they didn't see Aaron or her as their leader, so they feel, Moses is gone. Is he, is he ever going to come back from us? It's been, it's been four weeks already, 28 days. Is he ever coming back? Five weeks, 35 days. Maybe he's lost. Maybe the Lord has taken him from us. We need... We need something to lead us. Moses led us out of Egypt, they said, so we need a new leader. That was not the case. God led them out of Egypt. It was the Lord who sent all the plagues. It was the Lord by the cloud and the day and fire by night that led them to the Red Sea. It was the Lord who parted the waters of the Red Sea. It was the Lord who made the quail and manna come each day. It was the Lord who made those bitter waters sweet. It was the Lord who made water come from the rock. But here, they act as though it was Moses. Moses brought them out of Egypt. Before Moses had gone up into the mountain, the people had heard the Lord speak. What did God speak to the people? Out loud, that was so loud they couldn't take it anymore. But what did God speak to them in that time? Kenton, the laws, the Ten Commandments, they had just heard, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And yet, because Moses is gone, and because they remember the ways of the people of Egypt, those sinful, wicked ways, and because there are those amongst Israel who are not saved, who love sin and wickedness and not the Lord, they ask for an idol. We need something to worship. Make us a God. Who did they bring that to? They brought it to Aaron. Now Aaron 
was a good speaker. The Lord had made Aaron the speaker for Moses. Moses was a good leader. He was a strong man, but not a good speaker. Aaron was the opposite. Aaron was a good speaker, but not necessarily a strong leader. Maybe he was more humble and timid in his position. And he didn't have the guts to stand up to the people. So the people come to him, and in his timid state, he easily gives in to them. But in that time, he's thinking, what shall I do? Just take Kleenex box back with you, Kenton, there. Whole box, take it right with you. And you got it at your desk. You want to get up. There, the people want an idol. They want to worship this idol. They want something that they can worship. They remember those old ways. And so, Aaron in his weakness, what does he do? He gives in to them. Now, he comes up with, maybe in his mind, he knows this is not right. He knows that this is not the way the people should behave. So what should they do? He says, I know. I'll, I'll offer to make them an idol, but I'll tell them, give me your treasures. They probably won't want to, you know, who wants to give up their gold and their silver and all their nice things? I'll tell them to give up their beautiful earrings and their jewelry and all the stuff they got out of Egypt. Bring that to me, and then I can make you a golden calf. And they won't want to do it, and then they'll give in. But he was wrong. The people did bring their treasures. They brought their gold earrings and necklaces and jewelry and everything else. Then what did Aaron do? He built a golden calf. Probably took and constructed some type of wood object or something and then melted down that gold in a hot fire and poured it over top and then used some other tools to shape and make and form this golden calf. And then he brought that calf out, probably most likely too it looked like one of the Egyptian gods. Okay? And he gave that to the people. And he says, here, these be thy gods, the people said, that brought us out of Egypt. Here it is. Moses is gone. This is the new one that we will worship, our leader, our God. Now the people had more reasons that we see that they were looking forward to having this golden calf, this God. Because now, not only could they worship it, but they could have a good time. We see in the end of verse 6 the word play there. They wanted to party. They wanted to get drunk. They wanted to dance around like they had seen the wicked people of Egypt do. They wanted to live in that wickedness, sinfulness. Okay? They wanted to have a wild celebration. God had brought them through all those wonders. He had shown them all those things. And yet they didn't care about Him. We need to be careful too. We see in the world around us there are many we see who know who God is, who know what the Scriptures say, and we do too. And yet we don't always obey and follow it just as we should. So before we, again, jump to saying, well, what a wicked group of people, they just heard this, we have to realize we hear God's commandments each week on Sunday. And we probably wake up the next morning and we break God's commandments, we tell a lie. Or take something that isn't ours. Or disobey mom and dad. So before we jump on the sin of worshiping idols, because we think, well, we don't do that. Yet we do. We worship many things on this earth that shouldn't be. But take a look at uh, verse 7 there. What's going on? Well, this partying and this wickedness, this dancing is going on down in the camp. God is up and God is omnipotent. He sees and knows everything. And he's up there with Moses. What happens up at the mount? Verse 7, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I have commanded them. They have made a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them. And I will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? 
Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath, and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give to your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do to the people. God saw what was going on. God became angry. He told Moses, they're worshiping a golden calf. They're saying, he brought them out of Egypt. And God becomes angry, wroth. He wants to destroy the people. Stand back, Moses, and let me destroy this people, this stiff-necked, whining, complaining people. Moses is offered here even by God, I'll make you, Moses, that great nation. I'll destroy all these people. And Moses, I'll start afresh with you. Out of you can come a great nation. Appeal to maybe Moses' sense of his own. Ooh, that would be good. But Moses, Moses is not that way here. Moses rather speaks to the Lord, begs him, Lord, you just brought them out of Egypt. You just did all these wonders and miracles. And those who are around here in the land surrounding us, and those who are still in Egypt, won't they mock you? Here's the God who made a promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Here's the God who blessed the people. He brought them all the way out of Egypt. He brought them through the Red Sea, all the way through the wilderness, or into this wilderness. And now, he destroys them. Lord, that will not bode well amongst the nations around us. They will not... Think, boy, what a great and marvelous God he is. No, they will mock and ridicule you if you do that. Don't destroy him. And the Lord doesn't. Now, they need to be careful because in verse 14, there's always that difficult verse there. And the Lord repented of the evil. God doesn't change his mind. God doesn't sin to repent when he's a sin. So that's not possible. But the answer here is that God, who is angry with his people, also has unending mercy. That's necessary for you and me. We sin. But God here, although angry, hot and angry with his people, his mercy overcomes his anger because his mercy is everlasting. It endures from generation to generation. It never ends. It's as far as east is from west. And so... Moses hears the Lord say that, that he repents. But the fact is, God doesn't repent. He's not sending here. The idea here is that God's mercy is endless. He will not destroy. Plus, God tells us he will never destroy the righteous with the wicked. Although there are many in this multitude heading towards Canaan who are ungodly, there are those who are also godly. So, What happens when Moses comes down? Verse 15, And Moses turned and went from the mount, and the two tables of testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of God. Of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them to cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands, and brake them beneath the mount, and took the calf which they had made, burnt it in the fire, ground it to powder, and strawed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink it. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee, that thou hast brought a great sin? Upon them, and Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of Egypt, we know not what is become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, oh, no, we'll stop there. Suck it. So, Moses, on his way down the mountain, meets Joshua. And they begin continuing down, and Joshua says, Lo, behold, I hear some noises. I hear lots of noise. There must be an attack, a war on the camp. 
Remember, you don't, he didn't forget about the Amalekites. And Moses says, no, no, it is not the noise of a people in distress or a people in trouble. It is, a, it is the noise of people singing. Moses knew what was going on there, the wickedness of the people. And so they go down, and when Moses gets to the base of the mountain, there before him lays the wickedness and sin of the people, naked, dancing, in all kinds of sin, drunk. And he takes those tables and he throws them down, and they break in pieces the tables that God had written on. And Moses' anger is waxed hot, and you can imagine him weaving his way through the crowd, finding Aaron. Where is Aaron, the one I left in charge? And when he gets to Aaron, he goes, Now what is going on here, Aaron? I left you in charge, and now look at the wickedness of the people here. What is going on? And Aaron right away comes up, <coughs> excuse me, with all kinds of excuses. Okay? Moses, well before that, we see he takes the calf, and he grinds it up. And he casts it into the waters. Get rid of this wicked image before the people. Moses can't even stand it. And then he turns to Aaron and asks what's going on. And Aaron says unto him, Well, the people, you know how stiff necked you know, you know how, they're always into trouble and mischief, Moses. And, and they, they thought you weren't coming back. You were gone. And, and so they, they said, Aaron, we want a God, something to worship. And I, I said, well, give me your jewelry. And I, I just kind of threw it all into the fire, all that gold. Boom, out popped this calf. I, I, Aaron here is lying. He's trying to minimize his involvement. Well, Moses can't stand it. He sees how wicked they are. He scolds Aaron. Aaron doesn't really, we see that he admit his sin. We know he, as a child of God he would have confessed his sin. But then, how is Moses going to deal with his people? Look at verse 25. And when Moses saw that the people were naked... For Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from the gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. The children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. So Moses, knowing he must deal with this wickedness and punish the people, goes into the camp and says, Who is on the Lord's side? The men of Levi step forward and say, We are. And Moses instructs them, Draw out your swords. Go through this camp and find those you see running around, dancing naked in wickedness, worshiping that idol. And I want you to go ahead and kill them, slay them. Okay. Difficult thing to do. These are their own people. But yet, God does not order too harsh of a punishment here. God orders exactly what is needed. The peace must be restored to Israel. They must know their sins and their wickedness. And so, these sinners must have the punishment of death and hell. I asked there that last question, do we live on a playground or a battleground? The Israelites were acting here as though they lived on a playground, a place to have fun. It's all fun and games and enjoyable. That's not what this life is. This life is a battleground. We need to be doing battle each day. That's why we put on that armor. So that we can fight against the sins and temptations the devil brings to us. We can be ready. So our lives are a battleground. We fight. We use the sword of the Spirit, the shield of faith. All of those things to do battle with sin.